the discussion. Can I just say continue? <laughs> Yep. We'll, we'll call this an unlecture. Uh, e. E. Cummings did a series of five unlectures. So, in the spirit of E. E. Cummings, we'll, we will unlecture this. How do we change John to me? I have no clue. Oh, if you go into. If it's complicated, don't even bother. I, I could do it for you. Can you? I mean, like, here. Yeah, if you have me the computer, I can. I'm going to hand you the microphone. And, but then do we have to do anything? No, no I'm just going to hand it this. I'm so glad I stole this, this microphone from Elder. Excellent work. Has he forgotten that you stole it? No, I keep rubbing his nose in it. Oh. <laughs> well, actually, I haven't seen Elder on, online for a hundred years. Yeah. I mean, like I see his posts on Facebook, but like in a Zoom and stuff. Like Oh, I'll, I'll just zoom in just personally rather than rope. Yeah. A couple more minutes. Uh, Joyce, where are you coming from? I'm in Rancho Mirage. Rancho Mirage. I'm not sure exactly where that is. Palm Springs. Oh, OK. OK, that's great. Oh, that's great <laughs> that we can do this. I just love that. I know. Me too. It's probably hotter there than it is here. I don't know, but it's um, close to 120 here. Oh, <laughs> yeah, we, we have 82 and I've been I've been whining about it. 82? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. It doesn't take much to get a good wine out of me. <laughs> It's good though, because you, you you know you lose weight and you look at art. Yeah. Yeah, but you gain the weight immediately back once you drink some water. <laughs> well, the key is never to drink water. I was I'm looking for It's like you're speaking to the Europeans when they come to for the summer. Oh, that's a sweet dog. That's Coda. Oh, hey, Coda. You'll also see my daughter's puppy running. Oh, I think that's his tail. Oh. <laughs> We're puppy sitting. Oh, that's great. Oh, is that Dalmatian? Yes. Uh, we had to leave our puppy at home. Oh, she's a four-year-old puppy. <laughs> Uh, Maybe I should gather up the people and. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm talking here, I'm talking there. Yeah. Yeah, how else a bicycle? There you are. Yeah, it started a couple minutes ago. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Now that reminds me a little bit of some of the uh, Disney-esque stuff yeah, that they yeah. did. The uh, some of the California scene painters did. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. And Zoom credit What's that? Zoom yeah. eliminating yeah. Yeah. It's usually pretty good. I, I spent all the first semester like yelling into my microphone, Same. and then I found out that you could whisper it. Picks say volume. Oh, and so save your voice and ants ears. <laughs> <laughs> it was so much fun. So, you know, giving us a week to get certified on campus. And, and so the reason they go get us three days to get certified. And uh, then they said that was too quick, so they gave us five days. <laughs> Our certification process is a 40 hour class. But we had to do it online. Yeah, yeah. Four zero. Yeah, it's a lot. 
Jen, I was trying to tell me about that. I could think you didn't put the Yes. What what kind of police? Oh, John was at home. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. A travel Marshall yeah. Deerfield's book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there were a lot of people just dancing, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I need to find a way to bring people. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, Randy. How you doing? We're trying to guess what the traffic must be. Guess what the traffic must have been like out of from Red. Red Riverside. On Friday, Saturday, I guess. Yeah. Okay, maybe we'll get started here and just maybe one minute, let's get started just to give us all a chance to gather our breath. Rainy, I've been following your publishing. You're on fire. You're on fire. Yeah. Really are. It's great. Okay, are we still recording? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, I guess this is a good time to get started. Um, welcome to the Sassy Museum's uh, monthly conversation. And uh, this time, time we're doing it with uh, something that I'm usually completely at sea with what, whatever we're doing. This time I, I'm part of it. So uh, I, I have some sense of, of what happened. Um, and I'm, I'm just I'm glad we've got. Um, uh, first of all, let's just say thank you, thank you to, to Jean. So thank you, Jean. Okay, so because we've got two different audiences here, we've got the people here and the people in the computer. Um, and because of the odd nature of Zoom, uh, anytime I ask a question and someone's going to answer, I've got to pass their microphone, right? Because we're not able to have any two microphones on at once. Otherwise, uh, it's, you, you create a new universe. And it's, it's yeah. so good. Yeah. Um, and so, um, well, th this month we're doing uh, the words and images show, uh, which I hope you've all taken a look at. And what that was is um, uh, we had people from Mount San Antonio College, which is the college that, I'm, I'm that I teach at. And uh, now people from Mount San Antonio College is a strange thing because I don't, I think just about anybody who's lived anywhere near this area has been there at one time or another, right? So we, we, we tried to find people that really represented kind of the flavor of, of the college and show their art. And then people from who had been to the college to write to that art and write some poetry to the art. So it's, a, it's an acrostic uh, exhibition. And um, I hope you've had a chance to see it, but if you haven't, it's in the, the, the middle gallery right the, over there. Um, and uh, the, the point was to try to uh, add meaning, add significance to the, what these great artists had already done. And so um, what I'm, I'm just going to ask different people different questions, but we, we have different types of people represented. We have uh, a pure artist here. Uh, she does uh, nothing but, well, introduce yourself. Oh, I'm Ann Branningham. I do drawings mainly in graphite. Um, yeah, that's, that's it. Okay. Uh, and then we have an impure artist who does both writing and... I, I prefer the word hybrid. Um, I, do, I do some writing and um, I do artwork as well. Recently, I've been doing more writing the art than artwork. Um, but I've got so many things that have not sold that I've got plenty to write about. So, and then we have a pure writer. Yeah. A pure writer. That's a wonderful, wonderful label. Um, yeah, I'm Kate Flannery, and I'm a writer in Claremont and also a lawyer. And we have another pure writer. 
I don't know if I'm quite that pure. Uh, K. Andrew Turner, yes, that's me. I write uh, poems, fiction, and I have um, one up here, and then I think there's four others. Four others that yeah. we're, we're going to the, we're gonna to publish. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I am John Branningham. I am not a visual artist at all, uh, but I, I am a writer and a poet. Um, and I want to just talk uh, about the, the nature of this and what, what the art does with the poetry and what the poetry does with the art. And I think I'll, I'll start with the artists. And I, 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 I confess that my wife prepped me for these questions, so I'm, I'm going to read them. Um, uh, okay, so, so I'm going to ask the two artists, the pure one and the impure one, uh, <laughs> what, is, what is it that you're trying to accomplish with your art? Um, we'll start with you, Annie. Okay. Um, I'm a nature artist, um, which is really a broad term. Um, and it, you can kind of use nature artist to mean anything. Um, I started, I do a lot of leaves. So over in the gallery, everything is leaves. Um, and I started doing leaves because I was kind of doing like a, a deep dive into feminism and what happens with aging women where we become kind of invisible to the world, even though we're still important to the world. And leaves are a lot like that. You know, once a leaf falls off the tree, people just, you know, it's as if it doesn't exist. And, you know, they're incredibly necessary for um, animals and, and insects to have like as cover, as food. I mean, there's a million things that leaves do for, for us and we don't think twice about it. We just throw them away. Um, so I, I kind of like pushed me into to wanting to do leaves as a feminist. Um, subject matter. Um, and just the, the whole idea that overlooked is, is really fascinating to me. I'm probably going to be working on overlooked things just for the rest of my life because it is a really interesting thing. And um, I like that you can use art to take something ordinary and make it extraordinary because there's a bit of extraordinary in everything. And it's nice to be able to, you know, bring that to other people's view. <laughs> Um, I, I also, I, I forgot to say that I, I said the word lecture before and a bunch of people freaked out. Uh, this is not a lecture, it's a conversation. So please, if you have questions, ask. And if you have questions online, if you could type in the chat, I'll, 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 I'll read your question. And what, if they say a question, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it so everybody can <laughs> um, Okay, and then uh, Ken, what are you trying to accomplish with your art? Are you seeing those people on the- And I've wondered- above? The Am answer to that for probably 30 years now, um, and I'm still wondering. Uh, what I'm trying to do with it is to learn about that which I'm doing my art about. So in this show, it was about nature. So the question is, why nature? And I'll, I can't be as eloquent as Anne or, or put it in a theoretical base as well as she does. But I did grow up in Lemon Grove and, and I grew up in Southern California and I ended up working in the Forest Service for um, three straight years and then came back to them as a consultant for another 30. Um, so I've been around the rocks and bushes for some time and trees just have it. Uh, I am fascinated by them. Um, I'm fascinated by all growing things, but, but trees in particular, um, a couple of the things I did for this show were about trees mostly. There is something that goes on with nature once you get out of the city and you get out of town and you start leaving the vehicles behind and you start climbing upwards, um, you get to a whole different place. Um, John likes to talk about the nature of the city and the, the nature of human beings in the city. And that's all valid. Um, I still, is that me? No, okay. okay, I still uh, hold that when we meet other people outside, typically we see human beings in a whole different light, and that's part of it. And when we see the way the sun comes up in the morning and the way it passes overhead and the way it finally 
goes down and then we have to walk in darkness, we see the world differently than we do in the city. And I try and work within that feeling tone more than anything in my work. So I use mixed media. I'm, I'm a painter mostly, I also photograph. Um, and I work with mixed media and I work in a, a more non-figurative way usually. So well, let's you. just stay there. That's interesting. Okay. Is, is there something different that you're trying to accomplish with your writing? Well, it kind of, yeah. I'm trying to use language, spoken language. And when you do paintings, you don't have to slow down to use words and you don't have to rely as much on the, the manner in which language is used amongst people. You don't have to fit with that as much. It's a more immediate medium. So when I shift over into language, I'm, I'm trying to explore, I'm trying to talk about the wild um, outside and inside. I'm trying to talk about um, the growth of things and the growth of people, but more about events and things that happen. And so a lot of my writing is memoir and a lot of it is, is poetry and story. So that's kind of the, the direction I go with that. Okay. Um, so, so somebody somebody said that uh, writing about uh, music is like dancing about architecture, right? There's there's not you can't there's not a really one to one connection here. So this is not really writing directly about the art. It's something else. And I'm wondering, uh, Andrew, this might be a good what 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 is that something else? Okay. So. One of the things that was really interesting is I wrote to two different artists. Uh, one was Melissa Macias and the other one was Anne Brantingham. And they have two, there's two totally different art styles because Anne's work is very, very um, kind of like, um, like very 2D. So there's like the graphite, it's very clean in the way it's done. So it's, it's not, like there's not a lot of color, or there's usually no color, um, but the shading is just so exquisite. So there's so much detail in all this tiny little stuff. <clears throat> Whereas the other, the other artist I wrote to has different things going on. There's different textures in the, in the work and three dimensionality to it. <clears throat> and so kind of when, when looking at the artwork, it's what does the art bring out in me? What does it say to me? And what is my experience? What is my experience of the art? What does it remind me of? So I can uh, write about something to it. Um, and then also too, it's like, you know, one of the things about Anne's work is I don't, you know, she's very cool with the, with the picking the different and the, the, the scientific names and kind of explaining what that is. So some of the things that I did was look up what the plant actually was <clears throat> just to kind of get an idea of scientifically what it was and then that kind of led me down some other rabbit holes. So I wrote um, some, of, some a little bit about that, um, especially in some of the other, um, I think it was in the Bigelow piece, but uh -huh. mostly to that one. Uh, I'm gonna embarrass somebody right now because uh, Melissa, the other artist, you were talking yes. about just walked in. Oh, oh Melissa, yeah. <laughs> uh, Melissa's got the, the, the wall sitting there on this side, the, the one has a mouse. And, uh, you would think. Um, okay, okay, so thank you. Um, and he just said something really key, which is going down rabbit holes. And I'm, one, I, I, I'm thinking that that's something you could talk about. <laughs> I am a big fan of rabbit holes and, and spend most of my early morning hours going down them because it's just, it's an adventure every single time. And, and I loved what Andrew was saying because one of the things I do when, um, looking at a piece of art, uh, particularly art that describes nature, is I do what Andrew does. I, I look it up. I look at the thing. I wrote uh, to two of um, Anne's beautiful drawings, one a manzanita life, uh, leaf and the other one um, a eucalyptus. 
And then I wrote to um, one of Ken's photographs and I think that, uh, that was a riddle. And uh, it's not exactly a literary form uh, or a poetic form, but somehow his, his photograph of lichen um, really just sent me toward a riddle. And the reason it did was because I, I jumped on Google as soon as I saw this photograph of ly lichen. And I thought, what the heck is that? What, what does it look like? What's its color? What are its properties? What are its habits? I mean, is it alive? What is it? So I, I Googled, I started looking around and all of a sudden it occurred to me that this small thing that appears on a rock that nobody notices is a bit of a riddle. And, and so that's where I started. Um, mm. I, and and th those rabbit holes are for me the most productive part of doing ekphrastic writing because I look at a drawing and I think, okay, it's a eucalyptus leaf. But I don't know much. I know koalas and I know Australia and I know Claremont has a lot of eucalyptus trees and I know the bark peels and all of that. But but I want to know more because one of the things I like to do when I'm writing about nature and I grew up in the Pacific Northwest where there's a lot of nature. Um, but one of the things I really like to do is personalize the writing, personalize. I, I sort of um, speak for the thing I'm writing about. So I, I will write in first person um, uh, as if I am a, a lichen or um, uh, as if I'm a manzanita. What is that like? What is the manzanita experience? And what happens when, when those two things merge, the, the, the words and the art, is I find there's a beautiful metaphor there. Um, and it's a metaphor about how we exist in the world how this plant or this tree exists in a world and what is that interconnectedness? Um, and, and it just comes out in the words. So um, it's, this has been a wonderful project and I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be a part of it. Um, but that's, that's what it is for me. And, and I wanna talk a little bit too about what John said about dancing and architecture and music and all of that. I'm a firm believer in, um, putting all of the arts, whether they're visual or uh, musical or um, literary, putting them together and seeing what magic you can produce because it really can be magic. And I think that's, that's part of an artist's soul, whether they're a musician or a visual artist or a writer is that, that little touch of magic that you create when you are creating. So. Okay, so that, that's interesting. I'm going to follow up with a few questions on that. And okay, so um, part of what, what uh, I think all artists are doing is drawing out of the subconscious, right? And um, when I'm teaching writing, I'm usually teaching comp classes to, to students. And that's very much not an unconscious process. It's like, okay, X goes here and Y goes there and all that stuff. But this really, for me at least, it was drawing things out of, the, uh, out of my subconscious. And um, I, I think that's a little bit what, what you're talking about here. And I, I think all of us were surprised by what came out to some degree. And when you're working with, in the creative arts, you often are surprised. I wonder if any, anybody, either writer, poet, or both uh, could talk about that. Uh, yeah. So my memory is terrible. So I'm pulling up my poems to just take a quick look. But um, some of them, when I saw them, a memory came back, especially with the one that's here, the strawberry fields. Um, I was looking at it and then I got these memories of, of going to, with my mom to strawberry fields in New England and picking strawberries as a kid. And then also living here. And there was a place that um, is now a shopping center that used to be a strawberry field as well. And so it's kind of, those memories just kind of came up and kind of looking at that art kind of blended them together in a way that I never would have done otherwise. Um, <clears throat> and one of the other things which was interesting is um, I was looking at one of Anne's work, the olive, which was the Athena's olives. Um, and I had an idea of what I wanted to do with that. <laughs> and, and everyone here knows it because I was complaining about it, but I knew what I wanted to do with it because it was, it's uh, the olive is important to 
my family history and to me um, personally because they're delicious. <laughs> um, so I had an idea of what I wanted to write. Then I sat down and write it. It didn't come out very well until I kind of worked through it with, with you and uh, a couple other people. And then some of the other ones, I just kind of looked at it and just what I saw told a different story. And so I wrote the story that I saw. So it really depends on what I'm bringing to the piece and what the piece is bringing to me and kind of seeing what comes out of that. And the really cool thing is doing this whole project, I got to see all the art and I got to see three or four writers writing to the same piece and how we all have these just insanely wildly variant pieces on the same art, which was really cool. Um. And I'm wondering if you have anything to talk about. How, how does this art, how does that draw out of your, your subconscious? How does it draw out? Of, I don't even know if the subconscious is the right word. I should ask the psychologist. <laughs> um, ask again. How, how does, you know, you're working on these things and it, it's drawing things out of you that I'm guessing you didn't expect to be drawn out of you. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if, if that's true or you often describe your, your drawings almost like a math problem. Yeah, yeah. For me, it's very much, um, it's a problem solving, but I also get to, um, I'm always seeking peacefulness and calm. That's just a thing in my life. It's like, I can't stand chaos of any kind. So, um, I'm, and I'm assuming that other people like peace and calm. So I try to make my, my artwork look very, very calm. Um, and I go into a bit of a meditative state when I do it, like the, the shading, it's, I can't do it if I'm listening to too much stuff or there's stuff going on. I need to have a good 20 minutes to do, you know, just a couple inches. Um, so yeah, um, I'm not sure where I'm going here. Yeah, uh, so there's a meditative state there is oh, oh, seeking of unconscious. Yeah, but it also at the same time, it is a problem solving thing. It is a, it is a math problem for me. To, uh -huh. to make it look the way I want. Um, mm -hmm. I tend to describe it to myself as moody, although I don't think other people look at it that same way. Um, I, I am bringing about that, a lot of emotion, but I'm also making it look calm, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so. yeah. Well, if you were looking for peace, you were, married the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing but chaos. <laughs> That's yeah. You address that. So, um, I was interested in what Anne just said about seeking peace and, and using a meditative technique to get there. And I think she and I share very similar goals in that regard. I'm seeking peace too. Um, but our technique is really different. She is very careful, very meditative, very concentrated, and, and just very zen. She falls into her work and she's gone. I paint in with big canvas and wild expression and throw paint at it sometimes and scrape it off and add other things to it and just, just go the opposite direction but it's for the same purpose. I'm looking for the same kind of peace she is, the same kind of resolution of chaos. We just hit very different ways of doing that. How does your technique bring that to you? Well, like Anne, I surface after a few hours and wonder where the day has gone. If that illustrates that. And sometimes I'm working for specific content. I did a series on Vietnam, for instance. And while they were very abstract, I had my own content running through them the whole time. It's just that I didn't know what each painting was going to end up doing. When I start, usually I start with a blank canvas and an empty head. And I walk into it and we watch and find out what's going to happen. And so um, in the Vietnam series, I would end up uncovering material I never thought 
I was aiming for in the first place, but then it became obvious where I was going with it. So it's a, a, a kind of a subconscious process working its way out. Well, you, you also have been writing about Vietnam lately. Is that the same process or is that different? You know, that process, so I was in Vietnam and I had a lot of amnesia and, <coughs> and forgotten memories and dissociation. And I didn't have much memory at all about Vietnam, but I found that I was doing these paintings that were escalating in intensity. And then all in as a, as a shrink, I got called to 9-11, which was quite overwhelming. And it brought up all the, all the uh, stuff from Vietnam up. And I found I was writing almost nonstop during that time, just keeping journals. And then I started looking at the painting I'd done for the previous 10 years and the journals that I was now keeping. And I realized they were intricately related to one another. And so then we began the, the process of trying to find matches and connections and fill in dots and fill out story from within it. Um, uh, the Sassy Museum of Art and Jean were kind in letting me put on an exhibit there. And that exhibit led to um, a catalog where I, I showed that, that stuff. And so the clips of writing that were in it, now I've been going back six years later and filling those out further. And I'm finding I'm repopulating my brain again, that I'm finding where <laughs> where that stuff was and what it, what it says about what actually occurred and, and what I actually felt about it, which those were two things that I'd left out of the picture <laughs> as much as I could. So, so yeah, the, the writing and the art has, has gone hand in hand in that process of recovering lost memories. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask some psychology things and you can correct me in my terms. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if what you're doing with your art and what a lot of people are doing with the art is healing or integration of experience or what, what would you call that? I take a kind of a holistic view on, of psychology and the, the purpose of doing psychology theory. I practiced as a psychotherapist and a trauma psychologist for about 30 years. So I've got a little bit of background in, in this. And what I have come to, um, you ask, is it healing or is it integration of experience? And I don't see any difference between the two. I don't see healing in the psycho therapeutic endeavor, I don't see it as just symptom resolution in fixing life problems. I don't see that as the main goal. I think those are symptoms. And I think that we'd go for resolution by integrating our experience and becoming more whole as human beings. And that's, that automatically resolves symptoms. Is that helpful? That's great. And so I'm going to follow up with the art, other artists and poets in that, that same line. Um, is your artwork, does it help you to integrate the past? Does it help you to heal the past? Or I'm not even sure what the term is. Um, I'm going to start with Annie. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, and also when, when I was, I've, I've been dealing with pain for most of my life. And I found out when I was a teenager that if I could sit still for five minutes or longer, and seriously, like literally not move except for my eyes and breathing, um, that really helped. And so I'm drawn to lots of things where I don't have to move very much. So if you watch me draw, um, once I'm into it, it's just my hand, that's it. You know, that's the only thing that's moving. And I think that's kind of, it's a, it's part of me finding some, some pain relief while I, I draw. Um, so for me, when I, I've done art like Ken does, where you know you're moving your your body around and all that, and that just doesn't feel good to me. Um, so I, I'm working with what feels good to me, and I I think it's important that we all find like the thing that feels right. 
because uh -huh. um, otherwise, because when I've done that kind of art, I felt like I was faking. And that's you know, you have to find the thing that makes you feel like you're being authentic to yourself. Um, so so yeah, I think that's a, a an interesting thing that we can, you know. Yeah, we're not all the same, and it's that's kind of great that everyone well, has a different thing. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, Andrew, as as an artist, I'm sorry, it's a poet. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Are you doing this? In some works, yeah. In some other works, no. Oh. Um, like the the full length that I came out with a couple years ago was definitely very much about that. Which one? The heart, mind, blood, skin was very much about working through some of those things. And then some of the poems are just like, they're just for fun, just something fun to do. Um, sometimes it's just an, a brain exercise to get the brain working. Um, sometimes it's just living out a fantasy. So it's it's not always the same thing. And I think that what, that's what makes it fun for me is, because if, if I was just doing the same thing all the time, I just couldn't do it. My, my, my brain's just not wired that way. I have to be doing all these different things, which is why I do poetry and fiction and non-fiction and just all over, all over the place. So in that way, like, if I am going to be working on something where it's going to be very um, intensive, like Ken, like Ken was saying, that's stuff that um, I have to be like, and I'm more aware of when I'm doing it now. And thanks to Ken, <laughs> he he kind of helps. Uh, you know, like you know, when you're when you're in that space, you need to be in that space. It's taking the time and the space, physical space and emotional space, to be able to to work on that kind of art. Whereas other things, you know, when I'm when I'm looking at Anne's art, I'm not doing integrative. I'm not doing that kind of stuff. Usually, it's um, more of just responding to the work or doing something else. Because um, it's just when if that's all your art is, and sometimes it's just so hard that I just can't can't get through anything. So, kind of have to do a little bit of fun and a little bit of other stuff. And then uh, when I asked this question, I looked at Kate and your eyes flashed. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, if you're comfortable, you're, you're working on a piece about your mother right now. Um, and I know you're doing this very much so. So I was wondering if you could comment on this. Yeah, I'm working on a project now. It's a, a series of uh, poems about my mother. She uh, died in 2008. And I spent the last three years flying back and forth between here and the Pacific Northwest and um, a lot. I've got a lot of miles still to use on Alaska <laughs> Airlines. Um, but uh, one of the things I, I found was that while you're going through something like that, taking care of somebody you love who's dying um, or any other life changing event involving somebody you care for dearly, um, you don't really process it while you're doing it because there's so much to do. You don't pay attention, you just do it. Um, and you find ways of, in a way, avoiding thinking about it because it's so hard. And so you just do it. And I did that for three years, um, ending in 2008. And then it took about four or five years to clear out her house after that, which was another, another story. But um, what I found was that art um, was helping me revive some of the feelings and the uh, emotions and the experience itself that I was going through with my mother. Um, there, there's a, a, a Northwest artist whose name is Beverly um, Butterfield. And she does horse sculptures, they're beautiful. Um, her first set of horse sculptures were all wood and found objects, screws, uh, pieces of metal, and she would shape and fashion them into these absolutely gorgeous lyrical horses. Um, usually about four or five feet tall. Absolutely wonderful. And a friend of mine, after hearing me talk about them today, she said, oh, I'd like to buy one. And I went online and they're going for around 250 or 300,000 at this point. But there are two or three of them that are outside of the Portland airport. If when you're leaving the parking structure and heading out away from the terminal, over on the right are at least two or three of her horses. And I don't know whether they were her early horses or her later horses. 
But what happened to the early horses is that because of the materials she used, bugs got into them, the wood started to rot, things started to rust, the fittings that held pieces together started to loosen or fall off. And so she found another way to take these sculptures and start off with wood and found objects and pieces of metal. And then somehow, and I don't know quite what, how, she, how she did this, but somehow she converted those shapes into pieces of metal that would survive much better, uh, particularly if they were placed outside, which many of her works are. And um, I would see these horses every time I left the Portland airport. And I didn't really think about them too much. I just noticed them. I thought, yeah, I like those horses. You know, they're really nice. They're neat. They belong here. They're eating the grass, whatever. Um, and I realized that at some point, unbeknownst to myself, those horses were becoming very important to me because of their story, because they were starting to disintegrate and disappear. Um, but the artist had found a way to revive them and to give them new life and to give them strength and to give them a more permanent lifespan. And all of those things about those horses reminded me of my mother because she too was disintegrating and I'm 72 and I'm disintegrating. But I, I, the, the fact that I could look at a piece of art and make that leap between the art and my mother and even myself now as I am getting older um, was showed to me the remarkable power of art. And so what I did was I wrote two prose poems in response to a description that had been in a Portland tourist magazine of those airport pieces. And then I followed those excerpts from the magazine up with prose poems about my experience of, of getting, um, getting off the airplane and going down to the baggage claim and then going to the, to the car rental place. And you know what they do at car rental places? They always say, hi, how are you? You know, how was your flight? Why are you here? And I would always say, oh, I'm visiting family. And then finally, I just couldn't take that cheeriness anymore. And I would just fling these words at the hapless agent behind the desk. And I would say, my mother's dying. And it's just, you know, and the conversation would stop, but I needed the conversation to stop. Um, and that kind of uh, connection between what happens to a person who's experiencing disintegration and what happens to the people who, who love them and watch that and see it every time they, they go visit um, was a remarkable transformative experience for me but also one that I had not remembered. I had not remembered that effect of the art on me until I started thinking about those arts, art pieces and, and looking at Beverly uh, Butterfield and looking at her pieces and thinking, oh my God, those pieces were important to me. So in that way, it's a kind of remembering, reviving a memory, reviving an experience, but also, um, doing some healing and giving myself time to process through that very, very sad experience for me and, and come to terms with it. And the art helps. It, it seems to me that what you're saying is that um, when those sorts of things happen to you, you're living through the experience twice. Um, and if you do art to it, you're living the experience twice, but consciously in a healthier way of doing it. Uh, and Ken, you have something to say about this? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I think what one of the things that happens is, you know, as we grow, we have all these experiences, some of which are our own and some of which are our broader cultural experience, as well as family stories that pack in and we get this worldview going. And then something like the death of your mother comes and it really, really throws that into a cocktail shaker and stirs it up. And suddenly the world, you know, doesn't make the sense it did before. And, you know, as a shrink, I can sit back and say, I've seen more people gain more from having misery 
than I've seen them from having easy times. Um, because something happens in which we start resorting our life and we shift from kind of a, a mythic consciousness combined with the life experience consciousness. We shift from that to a more aesthetic mode of consciousness. An aesthetic frame of mind is very, very different. And when we do painting or, or writing or music, photography, even when we're doing that, we are shifting the way we see the world. And when that process happens for a long period of time, it's amazing what it comes from it. Um, so it has some to do, I think, with, with our own growing and our own learning, but it also has to do with our shifting our perspective and learning to be more selective with our perspectives and find more adaptive and more fruitful ways of looking at the world and about the things around us and the people around us and ourselves. So I wonder if I can follow up with you, Annie. Um, and you're, you're a person who has been a person with a disability for 40 something years now? 40 years. Sir. 40 years. Um, and uh, you've really had to shift your perspective on things, I'm guessing. And I'm wondering if, they, if that's what the, your art is about. Yeah, yeah, I was actually kind of just thinking about that while Ken was talking. And um, I'm definitely not using my art as like a way to escape necessarily. Um, I think going into the, that meditative state that I do to draw and just the whole, John likes to tell people that when I'm out in nature, I'll look at a blade of grass for half an hour before I start drawing, which it's a tiny exaggeration. It's never more than 28 minutes. <laughs> um, but I, I will sit there and draw and look. And that's like a real gift when you have an art teacher who shows you how to look um, because it, it lets you be part of nature and be really present. And I know present is like a, a catch word right now, but it's such a, a gift to be allowed to be present in nature. It's just, you know, makes all the, the bad things kind of just sink down. Um, and, and I try to do that with my art, it's just like be present. So while I'm in a meditative state, I'm also very present in while I'm doing at that. And it that does really help with dealing with um, disappointments because you know uh, people that have a disability, um, there is a huge amount of I'm not sure what the word is because disappointment is not anywhere near strong enough, but you know, you thought your life was going to be one thing and it's not, <laughs> you know, there's, there's like, you know, you can read all the, the, the happy posters that, that tell you to, you know, Monday, make Monday a great day or something like that. And, you know, you can do that as much as you can, but you're still disabled. Um, yeah. So it's, I guess it's like a coping mechanism, sort of, but I, I would put it, it's more than that. Uh -huh. And I'm just not sure how I would really describe it because I'm an artist and I don't use my words as well as, as a writer does. But um, for me, it really makes me able to deal with stuff better, um, whether it's like family stuff or, you know, my body deciding today's a pain day, you know, um, even if I can't draw that day, just the fact that I know I can go back to it in a few days, that's, that's a really great thing. And having it like as a regular thing that I do is, is also um, just something that makes, uh, you know, life a lot nicer. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, so, so Anne's often told me that being a visual artist is all, all, all about being able to see things, right? Knowing how to, how to look and actually see those things. So bringing it back to this, our, our show, um, we sat and we looked at art, uh, the, the writers did, and we learned how to see, see the art. And I'm not sure where I'm going with this question, except for maybe dot, 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 you can figure it out. Um, <laughs> how, how, what were you able to see? How were you able to see it? Uh, how did that change your perspective? And uh, I'm, I'm looking at you, Andrew. Okay. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, it was, it's kind of interesting to kind of kind of go back to seeing things because I, I, my first degree was in performing arts. Oh, <laughs> and um, I and during that performing arts, I mean, I took dance, I took singing, I also took a visual art class. I was absolutely horrible. <laughs> Can't draw very well, but <clears throat> there's it, it did teach me the appreciation of being able to look, and I think that was what Anne was saying is when you have an art teacher, they teach you how to look at something. So one of the things that I remember doing is like, I'd have this mic here and you're just supposed to sit there and look at it and not look at what you're doing. And so that was, kind of, I mean, not that I consciously did that with the art that I was looking at and writing to it, but it's looking at the art, looking at the art, looking at the art, thinking about it, thinking about it, making me maybe making a mental note or two, coming back, looking at it again and saying, okay, what is this bringing up? Right. So, and, and sometimes it was just looking at it a couple of times and then something would come out. And the other times it was looking at it, thinking about it. And in this case, you know, me and Kate were rabbit holing in Wikipedia, I'm sure. And just kind of saying, okay, well, what does this tell me? Like trying to find something that connects um, and, and being able to see. And, and that's the one thing too, is like, I, like, if I look at the art that I wrote to, I'm sure I could write something different now because I'd see it differently because there's a different experience that I'm bringing into it now than when I brought it a couple months ago. And I think that's the one thing that's really powerful about being able to view art <clears throat> is there's a different reaction to it every time you see it. And I think that's the same thing with, with writing, um, especially when it, with it's poetry and it's very short, you can kind of get through it pretty quickly, is each time you read it, it brings you um, something different. Uh, and I think that's kind of the point of, of kind of writing to the art is what does it bring to me at this moment versus what might it bring to me? You know, maybe, maybe I'll look at this poem 10 years down the road and be like, would I write the same thing to that piece of art? Would I write something different? And so it's, it's, it's also the one thing that was really cool, especially about the, the piece that's here in the gallery that, I, that really stood out to me is there's no, notes or not notes, uh, numbers. Like a like a ledger, and that brought out something that I didn't think it would, and it worked in the poem really well. But it's just looking at that piece and looking at the fine details and like, what is? Can I use something like this? I can look at it and say, well, maybe it doesn't serve the poem, but I can still look at it and see what each, you know, whether it's intended or not. Like, you know, maybe, you know, I mean, Anne's very meticulous in her work, but like if there was a smudge, right? What would that, is that as intended or not, right? What is the exact, how does it work here? Looking at all the details as much as you can and kind of pulling back and going in and pulling back um, and, and seeing what the big picture is about versus what the small little details are about. So it's kind of trying to get that balance. Okay, so, um turns the time. Uh, it, we've got about maybe 10 minutes. Um, I, I want to give a chance for anybody who has a question to ask a question. I don't know if you have any questions. You might not. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Um, I have a question for uh, those who provide some of the polls. Did you end up finding that you had um, different versions of different potential versions of poems for a single art piece? Yeah, we 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 kind of all fought over the which art pieces that we were going to get, and uh, and we definitely had different. I, I, we we fought actually most violently over Melissa's piece about a kiwi orchard, and I, I won that fight uh, because I'm because you're taller. Uh, yeah, and I'm, and I'm wily, uh, and um, but I, I think we all kind of saw it a different way. I I am I'm a person who has a great love of the Central Valley of California. And that's where the piece is set, I think. Is it, Melissa? Is it Central Valley? Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. And, and, and so I kind of uh, took my, my, my love of that, that place and my love of that painting and I put it together. But what, what, what do you all think? What, um, we, we all did different poems. To... There are a few, though, that had multiples, um, multiple poems to it, but we only posted one. Yeah, oh, yeah. I'll answer the question and then I'll, I'll send it over to Kate for the question. Yeah, so for me, I, I only had one poem or one art piece that I wrote two poems to. 
and that was to Anne's and the one I just destroyed because it was terrible. I didn't like it. Um, but I really didn't write more than one poem to a piece because really there's only, that's really all I could get from that one piece at that time. So, I mean, in, in, that's just kind of how I work is I, I'm, I'm a very anxious person. So it's like, oh God, we have to get this done. So I'll just come up with something and not really think too much about it until like later on, like when I'm doing revisions and stuff. Um, but, you, you know, maybe down the line, I could write another poem to it. But for right now, it's, it's just, it's too, it's too much of the same, kind of looking at the same thing that you can't really get too much out of it. Or at least I can't um, for one piece without having more, more time between it. Like if I was like, I think one interesting thing to do is to write a poem to the same piece maybe every year. That might be an interesting, but it, but in the short time span, I, I, there was just only one one piece per uh, per arc that I was working on. Good question. That that would be a fascinating sociological experiment. Yeah. Uh, you know. Uh, I think we should have done. I think we should. I've got to find the right piece. You've got to drum something. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Uh, oh yeah, Kate. Okay. Yeah, when uh, one of the, the pieces that I wrote to was on one of Anne's eucalyptus leaves. And again, I, I draw on my own experience from the Pacific Northwest. I came down to Southern California when I was 18. And I, I had this idea of what a tree was. And in my mind, a tree was deep, dark green. It had long branches, it had needles, it had cones, and it had a brown rough trunk. And, and that was it. And of course, I've spent I don't know, you know 40 years down here now, and um, and it turns out that that that's not the only way a tree looks. And but it took me a while to get out of that habit of thinking these things, these eucalyptus trees are their their leaves are dusty green, their bark is always peeling. What's that about? Um, and then sometimes they just fall over on their own. Um, and the only thing I thought I liked about them was maybe the fact that they smell good. So my first inclination was to write about that, write about my transition and how I was seeing, how my, my first view of a tree um, was uh, that particular eucalyptus tree was different than the way I see a tree now. But then what I did, and I, I, I did some writing on that. I, I threw out some words and it was okay, but it was more about me than it was about the tree. So then what I did was, I, and I really have to thank Anne for this. Um, I, 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 I followed her way, the Anne way. And, and I used to take my walks every morning and I would walk by a lot of eucalyptus trees. So I said, okay, I'm gonna just look at that darn thing and see what it is. And I noticed there's this red vein that goes up the center, the spine of the leaf. And you know, if you go up to a eucalyptus tree and you touch it and you touch the bark that's starting to peel off or you touch the new bark that's underneath and you look at the different colors. And then I started collecting all the eucalyptus branches that were in the street that had fallen off the trees. And I bring them home and I'd, I'd put them on my mantle. I'd put them around the house. The cat loved it. And, <laughs> but, but the point was I started doing what, what Anne always does. And that is look look at it, what is that thing about? And that's the way I went because it turned out that my first reaction in looking at that leaf was to talk about me, me and the tree. But what really came out better, I think, was the poem that I wrote about the tree. And, and, and it got my mind going in a much more, I think, creative way. So yeah, I had, I had two different ideas and I had jotted down some things about my first thinking about how to write about that eucalyptus, but then it it wasn't it wasn't good. I mean, it was it was okay, but it wasn't what I wanted to get out of that drawing. So thank you, Anne. It's interesting. Uh, I I uh, my I grew up in. Los Angeles mostly, but I'm from the Midwest and being when I was young. And uh, this whole project brought up that kind of memory, right? Where I didn't, when I came to California, well, like I was young enough, I didn't believe that um, palm trees existed. I thought they were just four cartoons, you know? 
Um, and like I, I, I had my own conceptions of, of what trees were and all of that was brought up by this whole project, you know, that, 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 that deep memory of that thing. Um, well, okay, so we are about done with our hours. So um, we could do maybe one question or maybe I could uh, convince somebody to read a poem, one of those two things. Um, uh, so if you have any questions in, in, in Zoom land, that'd be great if you have any questions in, I don't know what this land is. Uh, um, Pomona. Real life. Real life. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that'd be great. Uh, or, or I'm going to impose on uh, one of these three poets to read something. We could call it MeetSpace. The MeetSpace? MeetSpace. <laughs> MySpace and MeetSpace. Um, would anybody like to read a poem? I'll do it. You All right. I think if I can find it. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, this is based on Anne's work, Eucalyptus II. The eucalyptus doesn't even belong here. It's a newcomer, an alien, an invader that pushes the natives around. Its shaggy branches drip in unkempt clumps. It peels off the stiff shards of its bark, an undressing that no one wants to watch. But when the loosened husk drops down, and all that's left is firm white skin. And when I put my hand on its smooth newness, hard and clean to the touch, and when I see the rosy veins of its dusky green leaves and breathe in their healing scent of strongest sage and heady mint, I remember too the warm summer nights and a softly voice next to me in the dark. Uh, okay, well, uh, thank you very much. And I hope you all experience the art in there. And would, uh, you can talk to the artists, you can talk to Melissa uh, and the poets. And um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, people in Zoom land, if you'd like me I'll, to, I'll take you over and give you a tour of the, of the gallery. Okay. Um, Walk you over. Okay, so we've got this, this this great show going right now, but that's not us. Um, going over here, and we, we've got four different walls with four different artists. The first one is Ken Johnson, who you can see he's still on the thing there. And so, does some really extraordinary work. He does some really good photography too. I'm not sure that's coming off very well. This one. I had to have on, on the, the thing because he, he nearly died from taking this picture. And uh, he was up in Sequoia and had a, a heart clot, uh, uh, not a heart clot, uh, a blood clot uh, as he was hiking. And so just to get that one shot. So I thought, well, that's gotta be up. And so his other photography here. And then this is the stuff that really is typical of Ken. Absolutely gorgeous work. The other artist, another artist is Peter Churchill. And he does sort of a, I don't know, suburban pictures of suburbia. Um, and the, the, he does a bunch of water towers. Uh, and then uh, we were talking about Anne and her work. She does, um, it's not photorealistic, but it's very, very detailed pictures, uh, pencil drawings of, of plant life. And here's, I think those are the ones she just wrote to, that the poem was about. And that, this is manzanita leaf. And then this is most typical of Anne. She has these really tiny detailed work. And then we have our, our other artist, uh, Melissa, and she's a professor at Mount Sac, and she does also, like, like my wife, Anne, she does very, very detailed work. And you can, I, I don't know if you can see the numbers that are in there that, that, uh, that Andrew was talking about. This was my favorite here, just love this piece. That's the piece I was talking about. I don't know if you can see that very well. It's, it's got an orchard there in the middle. And then we have sculptures. 
Yeah. And then they're kind of mini sculptures. Yeah. And that's it. Okay, and that is the show. If you'd like me to take you back and look at anything, I'd be happy to do that. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming. I can't hear you. You're on mute, uh, Hal. Ah.